I just spent the last week Uh, decoding Gen 2 shiny colors. <laughs> and I think I've got it. So for the last uh, however long it's been, we've had a shiny Pokemon Explain series going on, and we always have some sort of series like that going on where we look at something and explain it, because, you know, that's what we do here. Uh, in this particular series, we looked at shiny colors of Pokemon and explain why they are like they are. Like how shiny Palo Sand is black, referencing the black sand beaches all around Hawaii. Shiny Bunnelby is light gray with red eyes, referencing albino bunnies, which are super common. Shiny Wishy Washy turns golden, as canned sardines tend to turn this color, and there's, there's more. But these are all the more recent Pokemon, Gen 6 onwards. At this point, Pokemon started using models and textures rather than sprites, and this is when shiny designs really started taking off. But here's the thing. I said in those videos that Gen 1 through 5 Pokemon were given shiny colors sort of at random. I specified that any good explanation, like Caterpies, for instance, is just a coincidence. Either that, or I'm really good at researching and BSing. Gosh dang it! This is an internet theory channel, so Lord knows I'm gonna BS as much as possible. But after the second video in the series, and then especially after the third one, uh, oh man, the number of times I was sent this tweet is insane. No hate for this guy though, he runs an awesome website and you should check it out. We talk, it's cool and great, I love him. Anyway, the tweet. Debunking Shinies. Most fans think shiny colors in generations 2 through 5 were determined via a palette swap, which is to say, Pokemon of the same color have the same shiny colors. But actually, that's not the case. Shiny colors have always been handpicked by the developers. The evidence here being that, well, there is no clear algorithm or rule set. I mean, look at the Pokemon he used as examples. Clearly, you know, an algorithm wouldn't do that. But unfortunately, for both of us, there is no hard evidence meaning there's no interviews with any of the developers or designers that strictly says it is one way or the other. All we have is speculation. So I, I totally get where both sides are coming from. I heard from somewhere that the older shinies were picked by code, swapping the palettes to the next available one, and it seems to make sense. I mean, there's evidence of it. So many blue Pokemon turn pink and purple, and loads of brown ones turn green. Like, too many that a designer wouldn't willfully choose those, right? Because why would you make all the shinies do that when you could make them unique or have a reason behind their shiny color, you know? And plus these patterns seem to sort of insinuate that there's some level of rules, shiny rules, and if there are rules like that, then you can easily program a bot to do it. Uh, so yeah, it makes sense that there could be an algorithm, even if there is no hard evidence for it. And I do want to also clarify, as other people have said the same thing, there's no code in the game that says to do that, it's because why would they bother putting the code in the game when instead they could just do the code on a computer, it generates the shiny, and then you take that and make it the sprite. That's what, that's what we're saying by there's an algorithm. It's, it's not an algorithm in the code. But anyway, on the flip side, loads of Pokemon barely change with their shinies, as if the developers didn't want them to change too much. Like Pikachu. Could you imagine if their series mascot changed super drastically? The same goes for the starters, and also the legendaries, and story important Pokemon. And some colors, for some of the shinies, literally do not change. For the last week, I've been staring at Photoshop doing all sorts of experiments with all these sprites, and I was learning all sorts of things. I specifically looked at Gen 2 shinies because Gold and Silver introduced shiny colors, and also all the Pokemon at the time only had four colors, and two of them were black and white always, so it's a lot easier to figure out if there's any patterns when you're limited to just two colors, you know? Plus, by the time we reached Generation 3, if there were an algorithm, then could that have been changed come Gen 3? And if so, are the Gen 1 and 2 Pokemon also changed to follow the new algorithm, or are their old shiny colors grandfathered in? There's way too many variables, so we're going to be looking at the Game Boy Color sprites. But notably, I had always previously thought that in all of the older gens, especially, all of the colors were changed in the shinies. I heard this when the topic of newer shinies was brought up in a video I'll link to in the description that actually I think is also where I heard the algorithm idea the first time. It's a good video that explains why newer shinies look so weird. A lot of newer shinies 
keep one or two of their colors because they are clearly hand designed as most of the newer shinies, especially in Sun and Moon, all reference something real, with one or two exceptions. But this is completely unlike the older shinies, which for the most part don't reference anything unless you really start looking and stretching how far logic can go and thought processes and... And also, all of the colors change, was the old thinking. All of the colors in the old ones change, even if only slightly, whereas now there's loads of colors that stay the same because they don't need to change for the reference. But no, it turns out that even back when Chinese were a brand new thing, some colors do stay the same. Photoshop has awesome tools. The color picker will tell you exactly which shade of the color you click on is, and to my surprise, one of Mr. Mime's pinks stays the same pink in its shiny. Tengala's feet stay the same. Dunsparce yellow stays the same. Yanma's green face, the same. And this is arguably evidence of developer tampering and not just an algorithm because an algorithm would always do something. It has rules that it has to follow, so it's going to apply them. So clearly, developers are involved. So clearly, there is no algorithm at all is a very faulty way of thinking. Because life isn't black and white. We had a Pokemon theme about this. It's not strictly one or the other. There is plenty of evidence of developer tampering, and there's plenty of evidence for an algorithm. Especially when you look at some of the drastic changes between generations. Original shiny Charizard was dumb Barney, but Charizard is way too cool to have such a lame shiny, so its shiny got changed drastically to black and red in the following games. Edgy colors for an, at the time, edgy Pokémon! Diglett is a great example too. Oh yeah, its brown remains the same too, by the way, but its reddish nose turns purpley blue, and the dirt does too. But blue dirt doesn't make sense. So in the later games, the dirt stays the same dirt color, because why would the dirt around a shiny change if it's the animal that's changing and not the stuff around it, you know? An algorithm wouldn't be able to tell the difference between what is dirt and what is diglet. So obviously, for sure, developers have a hand in it, but that doesn't mean they did everything by hand, which we'll get to. But the idea here is, they could very well have had an algorithm go through and make all the initial changes, and then the developers individually sign off on them, or make changes as they see fit like Diglett's Dirt. Or making sure important Pokémon have decent shinies, like Pikachu, Charizard, Celebi, etc. And again, for the people in the back, that means that while I'm explaining how I think the algorithm works, there will be a few exceptions, as you'll see. But I'm pretty sure I've got it. Or at least something very close. I mean, I made a flowchart that'll explain all of it, and I'm not gonna show it to you now, but I will tell you, vast majority of them work with this flowchart, but we'll get to that. Let's find patterns and go through my thought process when it came to decoding this. And hey, real quick first though, very special announcement, I just really want to say huge, huge thank you to everybody who shows support in any capacity, Patreon, uh, merch from Noggin.net, even just likes and views, all helps make everything here possible. And as a means of saying thanks, we went through the manufacturing process and are now offering a phone call to me. What the perfect timing, though. What's that? There's a deal? The phone call was totally, like, not planned at all. That's just perfect timing. I get, like, two phone calls a month, and what do you know? Uh, but seriously, though, um... We now have a shiny variant of our most popular shirt. It's this one. Super soft, super duper luxurious, and now it comes in dark green and a glow-in-the-dark transmutation circle. It's super cool, and it's so new that I don't even have one yet. But you can check that out and help support us even more by going to the link in the description, noggin.net. Now back to shiny Pokémon. So, discovering that some shiny colors stay the same is definitely worthy of a note here. And here's another surprising thing I learned. Even in the non-shiny sprites, almost none of the Pokémon are the same color. Yeah, even the ones you'd expect to be, like Drowsy and Hypno. Nope, slightly different shades. The underbelly of Cyndaquil, Quilava, and Typhlosion? All unique. All of Totodile's evolution? All unique. All of the greens in Bellsprout's line? 
all different. Sentret's dark brown stripes versus Furret's dark brown stripes? Different shades of dark brown. In fact, we're better off listing the few Pokemon that do have at least one of the same colors, like Coughing and Wheezing, Slowbro and Slowpoke, and Jigglypuff's line. And all of their shinies are exactly the same, too. So, that's a bit of evidence of the code, the algorithm, just adding some hex code to the color. Now, if you don't know, all colors have a hex code. You can see them in Photoshop. You can simply add to this number to get a different color. And if you're confused about how you add to a number with letters in it, let me explain real fast. This is a hexadecimal. It's one of the ways computers think, like binary, zero and one. There are only two numbers. We humans, which I am, typically communicate to each other with decimals. This is base 10. There are 10 numbers, zero through nine. For any numbers bigger than nine, you add an extra digit. But you can go higher than base 10, which is where a hexadecimal comes in. It's base 16, meaning there are 16 digits. 0 through 9, and then the higher ones are represented by A through F. So to count, you would go 6789, A, B, C, D, E, F, and this is how color code works. So yes, you can have this color code with all of the letters in it and just add to it with a number that also probably has letters in it, and you get a different color. See what I mean? This was my first thought process. If all the color values that are the same change into the same color when shiny, like with all these, then that's proof of that. And that's the algorithm. It's simple. And then the reason other Pokemon change drastically, even from the others in their own evolution line, is because they themselves are slightly different colors too. But it turns out that's wrong. Because while nearly every Pokemon is a unique color, likely to show off the capabilities of the Game Boy Color, there are some that are the same, but that do not turn into the same color when shiny. One of the only examples of non-evolutionary lines sharing a color is with Clefis ears and Sand Slash's spikes, for example. They are both totally different when shiny, though. Muck and Grimer are the same exact color normally, but their shinies aren't. Abracadabra and Alakazam are all the same colors too normally, but the shinies... While Abra and Kadabras are the same, Alakazam's is not. Is this just dev tampering? Making Alakazam stand out more from the rest? Maybe. But if not, then why did the values change differently between them? Clearly, if there is a code, it is not so simple. So, that method is a bust. But there has to be something, because there are so many patterns we can find, so I started jotting down a lot of these patterns. Like this. Normal color on the left, and the shiny color it turns into on the right. Then I put that with the other Pokémon that had similar changes. Now, I should note that I did not do every single Pokémon. I gave myself a time limit of one week for this video for a reason. But you can see here, clearly, blues really like turning pink and purple. Almost all of them do. On the flip side, pinks really like turning light blue, or just into a darker pink. But also, reds really like swapping for blue. And isn't red just a darker and more saturated pink? And isn't this blue just a darker and more saturated light cyan? Something's going on. Even the details in Pokemon that aren't primarily these colors are swapping this way, like Machoke's veins. Red to blue. Browns super commonly turn green, and greens commonly turn brown. Again, even in the details and in places you wouldn't expect, like Electabuzz's shadow. Turns out it's light brown, and then in its shiny, it's light green. And then when I discovered this about Electabuzz, I noticed something. My notes here, right here. That's basically all of the electric type Pokemon and Typhlosion. So if we look at all of the electric type Pokemon now, Voltorb and Electrode are the only ones that do not follow this pattern. This pattern of basically, emphasis on basically, we'll get into specifics later, basically just darkening some amount. So maybe if there is an algorithm, maybe it takes the Pokemon's type into consideration. Are there any other types that have similar patterns? Turns out there are. All. Emphasis on all. All of the normal flying Pokémon get shifted yellow-green. Some more yellow, some more green, but yellow-green all the same. And if we expand this to just flying type, we see that a lot more fit in here too. Skarmory, Togetic, Beedrill, Scizor, even Natu and Zatu. They are already green, so the shinies just add a bit of yellow. And we can see that the primary colors of Zubat and Golbat and the secondary color of Crobat follow suit also. So here we have 
nearly all of the non-legendary flying types, though Ho-Oh also fits here. But we're missing Murkrow, Delibird, Aerodactyl, and the rest of the bugs. But I bet they follow some other rules. But first, heck, even Dragonite fits this flying type rule, though its Prevos don't. But speaking of dragon types, there aren't many, so putting them all on screen, well, they all get light purple or magenta shifted. Even Dragonite, look at the color of its wings. So if there is an algorithm, I bet it not only looks at types, but also the individual colors, as opposed to the whole shiny as a whole. I mean, some shinies are so ugly that you can tell that was happening. What is wrong with Swinub? So any other type rules? Well, nearly all of the grass types turn yellow-brown for their shinies. I like to say it's their fall colors. The exceptions this time are Celebi, Bellossom, and the Hoppip line. Celebi being a mythic Pokémon makes it a good exception. The devs definitely did something different with it because it's such an important Pokémon. Just like the legendary flying Pokémon. They are so important, so they were likely overwritten by devs, if need be. But then, the Hoppip line. Each one is a different color from each other already, so if they all turn into the same brown-yellow, that's kind of lame. And that only leaves us with Belossum. Notably, the petals on Belossum are nearly identical. This red-orange coloration of them then might be something special, and so the devs got their hands on with this one. That, or Belossum is just a rebel. Nearly every water-type Pokémon gets an aquamarine-ish hue shift, as if they were underwater. Too many of them do this for it not to be a coincidence. Some clearly have it more heavily than others, and some you have to take their original color into context and add an aqua color to reach their shiny, but still. Enough of them do this that it's clearly some sort of rule going on. We also see a lot of flames turning pink and purple. Cyndaquil's line, Rapidash, Magmar, Moltres, and Charizard is basically Barney now, as I said. The only fighting types to not shift green are the Gen 2 ones. All of the Gen 1 fightings shift green. Then, quite a few poison type Pokemon are also yellow green shifted, though there are enough that don't that I'm not confident enough to say that it's a rule. But look, even Nidoqueen does it. Unlike the rest of the Nidos that almost swap to the colors of the opposite sex, which to me also shows evidence of hands-on tampering. But then why not do it to Nidoqueen also? Did they forget to do Nidoqueen? Like, just like how they forgot to make Nidoqueen able to breed? So those were the type rules. Are there any just common color rules or just patterns otherwise? Well, as I briefly stated earlier, a lot of the pink Pokémon just get darker and or more saturated, or it swaps to its complementary color, which is the color opposite to it on the color wheel. Quite a few shinies do this, though it's never perfect, meaning never the exact shade of its complementary color. But it's close. So many of them are so close. Muck purple pink to green, and darker green. Chansey pink, Chansey green. And it's more than just pink. Tons of shiny Pokémon just swap their colors to their complementary ones. Tentacruel's red to green. Fortress's dark maroonish red to dark yellowish green. Umbreon yellow to Umbreon blue. Pseudowoodo green to pink. Skiploom green to pink. And on and on and on. Upon noticing the complementary color connection, I started to do some playing around with Photoshop's Color Themes tool to find some color triads, which are basically like a complementary color, but rather than the color opposite to it on the color wheel, it's three colors in a perfect Y shape. I ran with this idea, and it turns out it may actually be the main thing that was used. Mewtwo Purple has what I'm going to call Mewtwo Mustard as one of its triad colors. And what do you know? It's not exact, but it's close. Ursaring Brown, Triad Dark Green. In fact, this works for most of the brown Pokémon. Hitmonlee, Cubone, Marowak, Kabutops, Tauros, Primeape, and Mankey, their specific browns happen to have this, their triad be this minty green. And what do you know? The shinies are minty green. Miss Magius was one of the odd ones originally, but now Miss Magius Pink? Meet its triad, Miss Magius Yellow. Drowsy Yellow, Drowsy Purple. Delibird Purple, Delibird Yellow. Foratris Purple, Foratris Gross. Middling pinkish red Porygon 2, how about its triad, Porygon 2 Cobalt Blue? We see so many pinks and blues swap around both ways, and that's possibly because pink and blue, especially on the cyanier side, are triads to each other. And of course, that means triad colors also explain the entire red-blue swap category of shinies as well. Sometimes, multiple rules work out. 
Ivysaur follows the grass type rule, but also the pink color has a slightly orangish yellow as its triad. Octillery gets aquamarine shifted a bit, which makes it this poopy yellow green, but that's also pretty close to just its triad color. And sometimes, the exceptions to previous rules follow this rule instead. Horsey and Seedra don't really get the aqua hue shift that most water types do, but take this cream color of its fin, its triad is deep purpley red. And what do you know? Also, they evolve into a dragon type, so maybe you can apply the dragon type rule of shifting maroony purple to these Pokemon as well. And again, to clarify for like the fourth time, it's not perfectly exact. This would be like absolutely solid, conclusive evidence if it were exact. But you can't deny that there's a pattern going on here. Sometimes even just the details work out. Crobat's wing blue, Crobat ring green, Magnemite cool gray, Magnemite greenish gray, Sneasel feather pink, Sneasel feather yellow, Jig's eyes blue, Jig's eyes green, brick outline on sand shrew to dark purple, Scyther's joints green to Scyther's joints red. But with these details, you might have asked yourself already, why did, why didn't the rest of them change? Why, why is the rest of the Scyther just slightly different? The secondary color follows a triad, but the primary color just gets darker? Well, we aren't done yet. I also found that some of them, it's rare, but some of them take the triad of the secondary color and apply it to the shiny's primary, or vice versa. Take the primary color of Doug Trio and apply its triad to the secondary color. Do the same thing for Persian. Take Abra or Kadabra and brighten them, take the triad of their primary color and apply it to their secondary color. It's the shiny. Take Clefable and turn its secondary color into the complementary color of its primary color. Shiny. So complementary color and triad colors, which I'll call triad left and triad right based on the direction Photoshop puts them in, are pretty easy to program an algorithm to figure out, all things considered. I mean, this is a very basic Photoshop tool that has existed for generations. And there is one other color wheel system that we can look at, compound colors. The colors next to the complementary colors at a set distance. And again, I'll call them compound left and compound right. Looking at compound colors gives us some more of our shinies. Spinarak green to purple, Rhyhorn's purple gray compounds into this cranberry color. Pyloswine compounds to be yellower, and the opposite compound color fits Swinub. Smeargle compounds into this yellow green. Compounding colors also explains the weirdness going on with Jumpluff, and Crobat's and Gligar's colors too. Dratini's underbelly, Nidorino's spots, even the weird purple Murkrow. Steelix's primary color compounds one way, and its secondary color compounds the opposite way. Even the anomaly, that is Psyduck, gets explained as a compounded color, albeit also less saturated. And just like with complementary and triads, there's also color switching going on here too. Take Tyranitar's primary color, find one of its compound colors, and that's now its secondary color. So again, if you haven't gathered already, if, Big if, if there is an algorithm, it applies rules color by color after it does so Pokemon by Pokemon. But upon finding out that most shiny Pokemon that don't follow a type rule, and even some that do, fit one of these basic color wheel rules, well that's just more evidence of a system or rule set. So an algorithm. But it's not perfect. There are some more changes done. The drastic saturation changes are really strange. Slugma and Eevee are the shining examples of it. I mean, jeez. Granbull, Remoraid, Kangaskhan, and Dugong do it too, and Unknown and Aerodactyl do the opposite. Entei's face desaturates, but the rest of it stays the same, and the primary colors of Sandshrew, Tyranitar, and a few other individual colors all over the place also just shift drastically in saturation rather than changing into a totally different color. Hmm. You know, maybe this is a big part of it all too. A lot of shiny Pokemon are the same colors as before, just more or less saturated or ever so slightly hue shifted. I mean, look at Fanfy for crying out loud. The blue is less saturated and the, mo and the red is more, but neither by much. This is the worst shiny. So here's the thing. You know, on top of RGB, there's also HSL, Hue, Saturation, and Lightness, used to explain colors on the color wheel. And you know what? So with the whole complementary colors, compound colors, and triad colors things, they were never absolutely perfect. Like, it wasn't definitive. 
Those rules by themselves got us super close. Like they were basically the same color, but not really perfect. But what if finding those related colors is just the first step? If, big if, if there is a bot that follows rules, it has to go down a list and apply them. A flowchart. What if step one is taking a color and randomly picking, like rolling a die, and picking which method on the color wheel to use, or not, to figure out what color to turn it into. Complementary, triad, compound, or stay the same. It then applies that, and then shifts one of these values up, hue, saturation, or lightness. That would explain why all of the triad and compound colors are only slightly off. One of these HSL sliders was moved slightly. But what if it did get moved a bunch? Well, let's look at Eevee. One of its triad colors is straight up green. And its shiny is gray, but greenish gray. So green with the saturation turned way down. Kangaskhan brown compounds into this grayish blue. If we turn the saturation down, we get a cool gray. It's shiny. It turns out that unknown gray is slightly blue. So turn the saturation way up. But now even adding this extra step doesn't give us absolutely perfect results. But at this point, it's close enough that unless you're looking for a difference, you can't tell the difference. You gotta use the color picker in Photoshop to tell the difference between the two. So maybe, maybe there's an extra hue shift rule going on, but it's the weakest rule. But then I remembered, oh wait, the Game Boy Color has an extremely limited color palette. Photoshop has 16.8 million colors, primarily, but it can go up to the trillions. Meanwhile, the Game Boy Color has 32,768 different colors. And even then, it can only show up to 56 at a time. So I grabbed the Game Boy Color's color palette. Yeah, right here. This is every color the Game Boy Color is capable of. I dropped that into Photoshop, and with this, I can compare the results I got trying to mimic what the algorithm did, if it exists, to what was actually possible on the Game Boy Color. And oh boy, am I happy. So rigging over the actual shiny color, we can use the color range selector tool to find the exact color within the Game Boy Color's palette. And sure enough, they are all there because obviously these are the sprites from a Game Boy Color game. But now bringing over the color I got with my experience, we find that they don't exist in the Game Boy Color's list of possible colors. Which means that rather than taking this impossible color result that we got with our algorithm, we can round it to the nearest color that is available on the Game Boy Color. And thus, we get the shiny color. Nearly, nearly every shiny Pokemon follows this flowchart. In my experimenting, I found that most of the Pokemon I worked on are only a single color wheel change and a single HSL shift away from their shiny color. That's it. You take that result and you find the closest actual color that's impossible in the Game Boy Color, and there you go. And if a flowchart like this can explain the results of the vast majority of Pokemon, and flowcharts are how algorithms work, well, I'd say that's pretty decent evidence of there being a process. This process in creating shiny Pokemon. Of course, there are still exceptions, though, which is why the end of the flowchart states that devs can overwrite and still tamper with them. Maybe they think a color should stay the same, or they have a particular idea in mind. When that is the case, they take the results the algorithm gave it and modify it. But this also explains a lot of the patterns we can find in the shiny Pokémon, because of the way compound colors are based off of the complementary color. Both are pretty similar, and thus we get a lot of similarities, like the blue-pink and brown-green things. Alright, so this rule isn't universal, as none of them are really, so perhaps there are other rules that I don't have in this flowchart. After all, it is just a theory and a rough estimation in terms of the chances, too. And also, again, to clarify, even still, this isn't completely hard evidence of the early Gen Shinies being mostly made by a coded process. But I would say that it is evidence. I mean, there's so many patterns. It's just not definitive evidence. You can't dismiss the possibility of an algorithm being there because some Shinies barely change or the same colors don't always turn into the same shiny colors, because that's how RNG works. 
But now what about some of the later gens? Well, they are a lot more work to decode, so I'm not going to. But if we apply similar rules that we found here, we can see that plenty of other Pokemon in later gens still follow them for the most part. I mean, here's Toxicroak with a hue shift exclusively, getting us its shiny skin color and the eyes stay the same. And then the pink Croaker gets hue shifted too, just also lightened. Done. Spiritomb green turns pink and purple to blue. Normal flyers, all of them are yellow green again. Celio, Whalemur, Sharpedo, Kyogre, blue to pink purple again. Zangoose, red blue. Manectric just darkens, as do Plusle and Minin's tans. Badoo, Roserade, Charim, Carnivine, and more. All shift yellow green still. So a lot of patterns and rules carry over. But looking at the big picture, there are differences and potentially extra steps, which happens when you add more colors per Pokemon, you know. So while a lot of Shinies pre-6th gen are seemingly random and abhorrent, no way would a designer willfully choose some of these colors, and why would they also all follow the same patterns as the rest every single generation? Why not make them unique and all that? Like once they do once you reach 6th gen. Rather than there being a few good reasons spread amongst all of the Pokemon being random bleh for their Shinies, now, Gen 6 onwards, the exceptions are the ones with seemingly no reason. Most of them are awesome and deep, and you can watch my coverage of those generations for all of those details. Anyway, that's my take on the whole thing. It is far from improbable that an algorithm made most of these, and while there is still no hard evidence of it, I for one believe that some code similar to this flowchart is what gave Game Freak the initial shinies. And then, after getting those initial shinies, they can go through and edit some of them as needed. But again, nothing conclusive. But what do you think? Think that I may be using cognitive bias because I can't believe for the sake of my own sanity that a human would willingly design Espeon this way? Oh, some of these choices are so terrible, like... So since I'm looking for ways to prove an algorithm, that's what I keep finding. But ultimately, it's all for naught because you still don't think that it's possible and in actuality I wasted seven waking days figuring all this out. Oh, for the fans, so whatever. Never stop using the noggin.